Welcome to Science with Sanjula, where we talk about anything global health. My name is Sanjula Singh, and I am a researcher at the University of Oxford. Join me as I speak to world-leading scientists who tackle today's biggest challenges in healthcare. My first guest is Professor Sir Richard Pito, one of the most prominent epidemiologists of the last century. Professor Pito spent his impressive career investigating why people die prematurely. He's an emeritus professor of medical statistics and epidemiology at the University of Oxford, and he even invented the meta-analysis and a theory known as Pito's paradox. Professor Pito, first of all, may may I call you Richard? Please. You mentioned that you fell in love with science at school at Southampton. Oh, yes. And further on, you actually fell out of love with science at the University of Cambridge. Well, I was still in love with it, but I certainly fell out of doing it well. When I was at school, it was just so exciting the, the teachers were excited. It was an ordinary state school, um, but the, the teachers were really interested in trying to get across was not the stuff in the O level and the A level curriculum, but what they found interesting. And they, they they just put so much effort into the ways they taught. It was really excellent. And I did very well at school, got a good scholarship to Cambridge. And then somehow Cambridge was much less exciting to me in comparison with that, I don't know why. I really don't know why. I can't understand those years. But it was just a letdown after the excitement of school. I wanted that same excitement to carry on, and it didn't. And probably the fault was more in me than in Cambridge. I don't know. I can't really sort it out. But anyway, so I dropped completely out and finished up, you know, really failing at the end of three years. I mean, that's not, not getting a first, second, third, or even selected a reset of special examination. The actually failing. Yes. It's like the bottom of the whole university. And they said to me, look, this isn't what should be happening to you. Come up during the summer holidays and we'll teach you some real mathematics. And so I did. And that really helped to get me interested again. And I I just sort of bounced back off absolute bottom into being pretty useless. (laughs) So at the end of the fourth year, this extra year, I hadn't done terribly well, <clears throat> but thought, well, I'd like to stay on maybe and do an MSc at Cambridge. And they said, well, look, I know it sounds odd to say when you've failed, you should stay on for a year. Now you've partially succeeded, you should go. But, but I think it's time that you left Cambridge. So I did and just was fortunate enough to stumble into the statistics co- course that was being taught by David Cox, who really is a remarkable statistician. In one of your previous interviews, you've said that you had a blue motorcycle and long hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, during your time at um, Imperial College in London. But as you said, you also managed to graduate. You were 24 years old. You just graduated from your Master's of Science at Imperial College. And um, you went on to get an interview at Richard Dole. And when he asked you why you wanted to work with him, you famously said, um, I do not know if I want to work with you. And actually, I do not know if I want to work at all. Well, it was silly. I just, I don't know what sort of world I was living in, what I thought I was going to be living off. But, you know, the sun was shining all the time, even when it was raining. I got a big 650 motorbike. It was London in the 1960s. So it was just such a lovely, I didn't, the, the idea of just being somebody who went to the office and worked just seemed really dismal in comparison. But when I started working with him, um, it, once you get your first results, you're addicted, even though in retrospect, it's not so is not particularly important, but you start getting results and that's very addictive. But the first 10 or more years I was working with Richard Dole, actually actually, the first 10 or more years I was working for Richard Dole, um, you know, I got to the point where I could give good lectures where some of the stuff I'd done was was original, but nothing had ever actually been of any real use to anybody. I mean, nothing I'd done had ever saved any lives at all. I'd worked on trials and shown that if you do them properly, then the treatments didn't work. I'd worked on, you know, various epidemiological things, which had already been studied by other people. And I remember saying to Richard in the late 70s, that's after I've been working in more than 10 years, that nothing I've done saved any lives. And he said, well, I think it's too soon to tell. You know, maybe some of the things that you've done will turn out to be of value. And um, that did turn out to be the case. So in the 1980s, we started to get results that really did save a lot of lives and did influence the way things were done. And of course, that makes life much easier. Now I would like to invite you to give a mini lecture of about one minute about any scientific topic you are most passionate about. Whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Yeah, well, death in old age is inevitable. Death before old age is not. That's the slogan we've got printed up on the wall in 
in the Richard Doll building. And so we're trying to say, why is it that people died before, and I'll just say age 70, arbitrarily. I'm 78, so I like talking about death before age 70. It means that I'm safe and you're not. <laughs> so we, what, why do people die before they're 70? Well, how many deaths are there before age 70 in the world? About 30 million deaths a year. And the death rates among people of a given age are in general going down, but the population is going up. And so that number of about 30 million a year, that'll probably continue to be true through the 2020s because the decreasing in death rates are counterbalanced by the increasing population. And most of these deaths now are from non-communicable diseases, heart disease, chronic lung disease, cancer. And the big causes of these are smoking, blood pressure, blood lipids, and I don't know quite how to put in diabetes. And the obesity, overweight obesity, is a cause of um, of high blood pressure, of dyslipidemia, diabetes. So smoking, obesity, but one has to say blood pressure, blood cholesterol. Um, but smoking is the big one in in general. In some populations, alcohol becomes very big. I mean, in Russia, particularly in the 1990s, there was this vast increase in deaths from vodka. Um, and that's subsided, but it's still very high. I think in every interview I've listened to you, you tend to quote that a moderate reduction in a big cause of death um, may be more life-saving than a big reduction in a, in a small cause of death. You were actually one of the first ones to, well, I might say invent a new research technique called a meta-analysis. It's this business of getting all the trials, not taking just the famous ones, because the famous ones will be the ones with, it, with atypical results, but all of them, really find out all the randomised trials that have ever been done, get the results from each of them, get them right, and then add them up. Now, this works only if you get really large-scale evidence in the process. How big should the trial be? Well, it depends on the question. I mean, it depends how big the treatment effect is. If you've got a very striking treatment effect, then you hardly you don't need to randomise, and you didn't need to randomise to show that cigarette smoking is an important cause of lung cancer because the effect is so big. But when you've got, for, you know, mostly, we've got treatments have moderate effects, especially treatments for cancer, treatments for heart disease, treatments for chronic lung disease, treatment you know, for, you know, treatments for TB. A tra if you've got two plausible treatments, the difference between them is unlikely to be big. If there's uncertainty about it, it's unlikely to be big. But then moderate differences can really matter. I mean, if you want to work out how to treat 10 million people, then why not randomise 10,000? Um, no, just but they, people just weren't thinking of numbers like that. So trial sizes ought to be, for many questions, in the tens of thousands. Um, then there's another debate about so-called subgroup analyses. Actually, there's one good example of something you did, because I think at some point um, you were publishing a paper in The Lancet. Oh, I'll tell the story of that paper. The, the most beautiful trial result we ever got, really, was in the 1980s. We wanted a test aspirin in the middle of an acute heart attack. You know, you, you've had a horrible heart attack. God, you know, you ring the ambulance, you race into hospital, get in the hospital a couple of hours later. Are they going to die today? Are they going to die tomorrow? Will they be dead this, this week? And it actually, we wanted to do a trial where you just give the patient half an aspirin, half an aspirin a day. You know, most doctors thought this was ridiculous, but we persuaded them to do it anyway. So they did it, and so we got half an aspirin a day or a dummy pill that looked like half an aspirin and wasn't. And we finished up with a thousand deaths in those who'd got the dummy pill, 800 deaths in those who'd got the real pill. You can't get a thousand versus 800 just by chance. This had to be real. Um, and, but it, and it's really important because it applies to anybody who's coming to hospital with a heart attack all over the world. I mean, this could apply to millions of people a year, you know, maybe a hundred million a decade. I don't know. But the, but you know, when we looked at, and, and we sent it to the Lancet, you know, absolutely delighted, you know, great, you know, we've finally we've got a result that really is going to save lives and also it costs nothing as a treatment. Half an aspirin a day really isn't that expensive. Um, and the Lancet reviewer said, no, no, well, OK, you've got this result, but now you've got to tell us who benefits. You must actually provide us subgroup analyses. And we'd, we'd, we'd written again and again that subgroup analyses are bound to... They're a reliable machine for producing false negative results. If you've got something that works, 
then you can reliably produce a false negative result by doing enough subgroups and pick out something that seems that seem, where it seems not to work. And so we said on principle... Chance alone you'll get... A, chance get alone, that's right. If you've, got, if you've got something that works equally for everybody and you do enough subgroup analysis, you're going to get false negatives. And those false negatives, they become urban myths. Doctors love something about particular patients. They don't want to know what works on average. They want to know what works for the individual. That's the phrase. Personalised medicine, they call it. And, and so the Lancet said that they would publish our paper only if we did various subgroup analyses. So we said, no, on scientific principle, no. They said, well, we're not going to publish the paper then. And so we just compromised our principles and said, well, all right then. But we also put in um, we, we subdivided the patients according to whether they were born under the medieval birth signs of Libra or Gemini or Capricorn, you know, it's completely <laughs> stupid stuff. So we took 12 subgroups. And, of course, with 12 subgroups, it's easy, even when you've got a beautiful result like that, to find... And it, it turned out that if you were born under Libra or Gemini, then it seemed not to work. If you are born under Capricorn, then it seemed to halve your risk of death. And, of course, that's so stupid that people realised that this was nonsense. So we put that as the first subgroup analysis in our paper. And the Lancet, when we sent it in like that, they said, well, you know, you've done the subgroup, so the paper's acceptable now. But you've got to delete this stuff about astrology. That's not serious. We said, no, that is the only subgroup analysis there that is serious. That is the only serious scientific subgroup analysis. And this was true. Anyway, they just published it. They published it with the yep. bird sites. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. 13th of August, 1988. <laughs> Figure wow. five, top, the top thing. It's, it, it's, and, it, it, and that struck, struck people. And it's been used again and again, this astro astrological subgroups. But still, nearly every trial that's reported finishes up with loads of subgroup analyses that are completely meaningless and that often give um, false negative results. Hi, my question for Professor Pito is, if we already know that tobacco is bad for people and we know it kills people, why would we still bother investigating tobacco? Still, smoking is a cause of about 20% of all male deaths in middle age and in old age, 20% of all female deaths in middle age and in old age, and actually for about 25% of all cancer deaths. So still, it's a quarter of all cancer deaths. Still in this country, despite that two-thirds reduction, Smoking is causing more cancer deaths than every other known cause of cancer put together. But you wouldn't think that. Look at newspaper coverage and look at COVID. Look at the co newspaper coverage of COVID over the last two years. Actually, in Britain, tobacco over the last two years, 2020, 2021, killed about the same number of people as COVID. We really do need to know the long-term effects of smoking seriously, and we need to know the long-term effects of stopping at various ages. And we've done studies in various other countries, India, China, various other populations. You know, you've got to get Chinese evidence on Chinese deaths to get the Chinese government to take it seriously. And at the moment in China, there's about a million deaths a year from smoking, nearly all male rather than female. And it, because if you take, say, people born in the 1960s in China, then the proportion smoking was um, about 100 times greater in males than in females. Um, so you're saying the numbers are actually still going up in other places and therefore it's still important that we investigate tobacco Well, more. in the 2030s, there'll be about 2 million deaths per year from smoking in China. By about mid-century, it'll be about 3 million. That's partly population growth. But you've, we, there's got to be systems set up that just routinely monitor the extent to which smoking is killing people in different populations, and this will help bring forward the time when um, when more and more effective controls get put in place. A few years ago, you were actually diagnosed with um, stage four intestinal oh, yeah, that's right. yeah. cancer. Um, and actually, you've told me this story before. Um, would you mind sharing that with us? When I started working on intestinal cancer, basically everybody with stage four cancer died of it. Um, there's no stage five, right? There's no stage five, that's right. And I mean, one of my good friends died um, a year before I was diagnosed with stage four. He was diagnosed with stage four and had died of it a few months earlier. So, you know, he was one of my very close friends. Um, and so basically I knew I was dying. And I've, they said, oh, will you take this chemotherapy and I, I knew that chemotherapy didn't work from my sort of previous days 
and, and you know, working on trials of colorectal cancer in days when chemotherapy didn't work. Uh, I sort of took it almost to be nice to the doctor. You know, he's such a nice doctor. It just seemed rude not to take his chemotherapy. But I didn't really believe it was going to do any good. I mean, I basically knew I was dying. And um, they, they took a chunk out of my cancer, see if it had got any special vulnerabilities. No, it didn't. Um, and it had it spread to my lungs. That's what makes it stage four. And so, and actually, before my fest shrift, about a week before my fest shrift, I'd been told, well, the metastases in your lungs are still growing despite all the chemotherapy. So I'm afraid that means that even if we remove them, there's going to be other disease elsewhere and this is incurable. So that was what I was told, told a week before my fest shrift meeting when it came to studying it beating obvious. But then I finished up getting my lung surgery, you know, to take out the bottom bit of the lung with where there were these um, things that had been cancer. And when they looked it down a microscope, they found that actually it wasn't cancer. The CT scan had been misinterpreted, and what it was was fibrotic consolidation of where cancer had been, but had been destroyed by the chemotherapy, so it was just scarring wow. where the cancer had been. And we were all going to go off on a family holiday um, to, to Greece. It was going to be our last family holiday together, you know, goodbye to life. And instead I got this news three days before we went, and so I went down. God, it was just amazing. I woke up my first morning in Greece. It was... You know, gentle breeze, Greek sunshine. There am I lying in bed next to my partner and, you know, with about 10 other family members within 50 metres. And, you know, it's just... I felt like Orpheus coming back up out of the underworld when he sees that first gleam of light. It was wonderful. Well, and then as a final question on this podcast, we ask all the professors, um, what advice would you give? I, I think I'd, I'd say whatever you do, you need to study something that's a serious question. Um... And what do you mean with a serious question? Well, I've defined serious as um, being substantially relevant to mortality, you know, being potentially a, an important cause of death. I've defined it as that. But there's things other than death that matter. There's aspects of the quality of life. I mean, you could study if, if somebody could really understand musculoskeletal, you know, back pain or, I mean, still more, things like depression or, you know, mental health where... I mean, apart from suicide, they may not be terribly relevant to um, to mortality. Of course, mental patients are much more likely to smoke than other people. Um, so, of course, that they finish up with higher lung cancer rates. Um, but you, you, I think, just be, study study things that are serious, and and or study something that's beautiful. You know, just because beauty is a sort of scientific quality control. And the results from studies that are beautiful, of beautiful questions, they may not be immediately relevant, but they might well be relevant in the longer term. And people who just study things because of the delight of the subject, um, often, you know, they often do find things which certainly change our scientific understanding and may in the long term be of benefit. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard. That was a very, very interesting interview. We've reached the end of the first episode of Science with Sanjula. Episodes will be released weekly on Tuesdays, so make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting app.